My name is Mark Garrett. I'm the Director General here in the Law Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, to Black Hole Place. Um, we're celebrating uh, the 250th anniversary of the foundation stone being laid here in Black Hole Place, so a nice historical location for a great event, I hope, this morning. Um, it was originally, for those who are maybe not aware, that it was originally founded as a charity school for boys known as the Blue Coat School, um, or in modern parlance, the King's Hospital, uh, which relocated to Palmerston uh, back out in um, the 1970s. Um, probably the two most famous graduates of uh, King's Hospital are, uh, are on, on Taoiseach, uh, Lear Vadker and Jedward. And um, <laughs> I leave it to you to decide who's made the greater contribution to Irish society in, in that time. Um, but my job here this morning really is just to uh, give you some, uh, I suppose, the, the logistics and how the morning's going to run, um, and then hand you over to, you know, uh, great speakers and panelists we have from the central bank to this morning to just discuss um, the guidelines in respect of the central bank's administrative sanction procedure. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. So please, you'll all be aware, you've heard it loads of times before, uh, please put the mobile phones on silent to turn them off. Uh, you'll be aware of the exits, the ones you've just come through, but there's also an exit if needed, uh, just here, um, on, as I'm pointing to, on my right-hand side, and probably for most of you, on your left. Um, the, just, the, just to know that the, the event this morning, in part, will be recorded. The intention is to record um, the speech and the first initial questions that I will put to the panelists. Um, but then when we open it to the floor, our intention is to um, stop the recording at that stage. So it's just to make sure that that speech and those initial questions are available for more broader use. But then we won't be, uh, as I say, using the questions from the floor um, at that stage. And just again, uh, the, it, just to be aware of that. Um, but that is really it. We will also be taking some photographs if anybody is, and you'll see the signs up around the room that we'll be using the photographs probably for social media purposes. If anybody doesn't want to be identified, please uh, let us know and we'll make sure that's the case. And please sit more towards the back of the room if that's the case as well. But please do let us know and we'll try and ensure our best to make sure that's the case. Um, so that's all the boring housekeeping uh, stuff out of the way. Um, as I say, you're very welcome here, and we're absolutely delighted to host um, this consultation event. And the process this morning really is um, uh, Shona Cunningham, our, the Director of Enforcement and Anti-Money Laundering at the Central Bank, uh, will give some opening remarks, and then we'll move to a panel uh, of speakers also from the Central Bank to maybe go through some questions. And I'll introduce that panel uh, when we get to that point. Um, so, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Shona Cunningham, who will address you for the next few minutes. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Mark, and good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to discuss the Central Bank's recently launched consultation on the enhancements to our Administrative Sanctions Procedure, or ASP, which is one of our key enforcement processes. I'd really like to thank Mark and the Law Society and its members for hosting this event with us today, and indeed to thank you all for your interest in coming this morning. As you know, since the enactment of the Central Bank Individual Accountability Framework Act 2023, or the IAF Act, the Central Bank has been advancing its work on the implementation of the Individual Accountability Framework. So in April, we published revised regulations and guidance on enhancements to fitness and probity investigations, on suspensions and prohibitions. We have also published the main IAF consultation on the Senior Executive Accountability Regime, or SEER, on the conduct standards and on fitness and probity certification, which recently closed four submissions. Today, we're talking to you about the key enhancements to the administrative sanctions procedure and the related proposed ASP guidelines, which are the subject of this consultation. And the ASP consultation is arising out of legislative changes which were introduced under the IAF Act, but also from our review of our experience in operating the ASP in recent years and our review of international best practice in this area. So the IAF Act has introduced new procedures and additional safeguards into the ASP. So for example, you'll see increased oversight by the courts. In developing the ASP guidelines, we've had regard to the legislative amendments under the IAF Act but we've also looked to further enhance the process to the introduction of amendments and policy changes in the ASP guidelines that we're consulting on that we believe and hope will support the efficient and effective operation of the ASP, will provide greater clarity for firms and individuals who are involved in investigations and inquiries, 
and will give further guidance to decision makers on procedural issues. So our objective then is to ensure that the ASP guidelines are practical, that they are clear, and that they're going to support a smooth transition into the operation of the enhanced ASP procedures and processes. So we've looked to highlight in our consultation paper what the key changes are that have been made to the ASP, and we are looking for your feedback on whether our proposed ASP guidelines are clear and your views on the key policy considerations which are underlying some of our proposals. But before I look to outline some of the key ASP enhancements, I do think it's important to ground our discussion this morning in the objectives of financial regulation. Financial regulation is designed to ensure that the financial system operates effectively and efficiently, which is so important to the stability of the economy, the protection of consumers and businesses. And this is why there is significant public interest in effective financial regulation and the role that enforcement plays in supporting the objectives. So guided by the principles of proportionality and fairness, enforcement powers are needed to support the objectives of financial regulation. Enforcement powers are strategically deployed by financial regulators to combat emerging risks, to address misconduct, and they operate as an important line of defence for the financial system. Administrative sanctioning powers like the ASP are commonly used by financial regulators internationally and are recognised as an important element in ensuring that the objectives of financial regulation are achieved. In the central bank, we take a targeted and proportionate approach to the use of our enforcement powers. We consider how our regulatory objectives are best achieved, including through our supervisory engagements and through our guidance and through the use of a broad range of supervisory tools. This means then that we take enforcement action only in cases where such significant action is merited, following a consideration of all of the facts of the case, including the seriousness of a breach, the harm or potential harm involved, our supervisory priorities, and the particular context arising in any sector of financial services. So I'm going to move then to the ASP guidelines. The composite guidelines being consulted on are going to cover all key parts of the ASP, that is investigations, inquiries, sanctions, settlement, court confirmation and appeals. And you'll see in looking at the draft ASP guidelines that we revisited and consolidated our <coughs> existing published guidance documents. So that's the ASP outline of 2018, the inquiry guidelines of 2014, and the ASP sanctions guidance of 2019 into one consolidated guidance document. And in doing this, we're hoping that this consolidation is going to be of assistance to everyone who's looking to understand the enhanced process and how it is going to operate in practice end to end. While there are a number of enhancements to the process, I do think it's important to note that much about the administrative sanctions procedure is actually going to remain the same. So the operation of the ASP is going to continue to include the following. One, the forensic investigation by the central bank of suspected breaches of financial services obligations by firms and individuals. Two, the function of holding inquiries. Three, the power to determine and impose sanctions. Four, court confirmation of sanctions imposed and appeals. And finally, the discretion to settle and resolve cases by way of agreement with the central bank. So I'm now going to look to highlight what we see as some of the more significant enhancements to each part of the process, which I'm sure you'll appreciate is not at all exhaustive, but an ease of the discussion. So turning first to ASP investigations, the IAF Act has placed the investigative phase of the ASP on a statutory footing for the first time. <coughs> But much of this process is going to look familiar to legal practitioners in the area because the legislation was in fact modelled on much of our existing investigative procedures with some changes in terminology. So notices of investigation, for example, formerly called investigation letters, are going to set out the breaches of financial services legislation under investigation. Investigations themselves will be run by responsible authorised officers of the central bank who will gather and analyse relevant information and documents for the purposes of preparing an investigation report. One of the key enhancements is that the investigation reports will be shared by the responsible authorised officer with investigation subjects at the completion of an investigation and prior to any decision on whether or not to hold an inquiry. Investigation subjects will then be able to make submissions in response to this report and this will be when we will also engage in disclosure. Our aim in drafting the guidance on investigations was to provide sufficient clarity to those who are subject to investigation and legal practitioners about our investigative procedures and to set out our expectations around engagement with an investigation. 
There have also been a number of procedural changes to the inquiry process itself. The regulatory decisions panel from which inquiry members are appointed has now been designated as a panel established by the Minister for Finance. And the ASP guidelines we're consulting on outline a number of procedural enhancements and provide greater detail and clarity on the inquiry process itself, which has been very much based on our experience of the operation of inquiries over the last decade. The guidelines also set out the roles of the various participants at an inquiry hearing and provide that in the future it will be the central bank's enforcement team or its legal representatives who will now present the case at inquiry by leading evidence, examining witnesses and making submissions. Turning then to sanctions, we have also reviewed, updated and consolidated our sanctioning factors and associated guidance. We did this in order to address the new statutory sanctioning factors for individuals which have been introduced by the IAF Act and also to reflect our experience in operating the 2019 ASP sanctions guidance since we published it. As part of our review, we took the opportunity in the ASP guidelines to give further guidance in relation to both our general approach to the determination of sanctions, but also to publish for the first time some guidance on our approach to the determination of monetary penalties for firms and individuals. Our hope is that by giving this further guidance in relation to our approach to determining sanctions, that we'll assist investigation and inquiry subjects, legal practitioners and decision makers in their understanding of the ASP sanctioning process. I'm going to turn then to settlement. Conscious that most of our cases under the ASP to date have been resolved by way of settlement, and I think it's perhaps the part of the ASP process with which legal practitioners and firms are most familiar. Resolving cases by way of settlement, in our experience, is an efficient and effective way of concluding enforcement cases, and in many cases will constitute the best use of finite public resources by avoiding the additional costs, time commitment, and administrative burden of full inquiries. And the IAF now has provided for three distinct and different settlement processes. One, undisputed fact settlement, two, investigation report settlement, and three, a no admission settlement. So in practice, this means there will now be different statutory procedures for settlement, depending on the stage of the ASP process and whether or not the settlement includes admissions. We're going to continue to operate a settlement scheme for admission settlements where the settlement occurs before an inquiry. So discounts of up to 30% may be available on an undisputed fact settlement that occurs before the completion of an investigation and up to 10% for an investigation report settlement that occurs before an inquiry. Settlement scheme discounts will only apply to monetary penalties and not to any other sanction such as a disqualification. In line then with our existing policy, we expect to continue to require admissions from firms and individuals for the purposes of settlement in almost all cases. And the reason for this is that admissions serve a key purpose in securing some of our enforcement objectives, which are around accountability, transparency, public trust and deterrence. So no admission settlements may be considered, but only on an exceptional basis and by reference to the non-exhaustive suitability factors which we have set out in the draft guidelines. All sanctions imposed via undisputed fact settlement and investigation report settlements are now going to be subject to High Court confirmation for the first time. So what we're proposing to do is to continue to publish public statements immediately following the conclusion of a settlement, but we will be clear in outlining in that statement that the sanction will be subject to High Court confirmation. So I'm just going to finish by going back to my earlier remarks about the central bank's approach to enforcement in the context of financial regulation. The central bank's mission is to serve the public interest by maintaining monetary and financial stability, whilst ensuring that the financial system operates in the best interests of consumers and the wider economy. In support of these objectives, our approach to enforcement has been and will continue to be based on the following key concepts. Proportionality, targeted deployment of the appropriate powers and rigorous focus on effective regulatory outcomes. So whilst enforcement is an important component of financial regulation at the central <coughs> bank, it is just one such component. We take a holistic approach to the assessment of the appropriate regulatory response when issues are identified, and we're going to continue to choose the most appropriate and proportionate tool to achieve our objectives. When we do pursue enforcement cases, we look to adopt an approach that is effective and fair, and we believe that the proposed ASP enhancements are going to support us in this goal. So in order to finalise the ASP guidelines, 
We are very keen to get feedback on our consultation from all of our stakeholders and indeed everyone here today. Following receipt and review of the feedback, we intend to publish the final ASP guidelines and related feedback statement. So I hope that you found the outline that I provided to you today informative. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to hearing your views and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Um, just joined here on the stage by a number of uh, other senior members of staff from the central bank who will help us maybe tease out some of the themes that Shona uh, had in that speech, but also answer some of your questions. So briefly, we would just do some introductions. Uh, on my right, I'm joined by Peter Gallagher, Head of Enforcement Advisory of the central bank. And maybe ask Peter just to say a few words of introduction as well. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so as Mark said, I'm Head of the Enforcement Advisory Division in the central bank. Um, that involves, or we have responsibility for providing legal advice and also policy development insofar as it relates to enforcement. We also have a specialised gatekeeper team, um, the bank's outward facing protected disclosures desk and uh, the bank's uh, unauthorised providers unit. Uh, we also have a forensics technology and data team as well. So that's, that's great. Sorry, I should also add actually that uh, I've, in my role, because of my role, I've been quite involved in the IAF development and the ASP uh, work that we're here to talk about today from very early on. Very good. And we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Uh, and on my left, we have Louise Gallagher and Francesca Hart, who are the co-heads of the enforcement investigations in the central bank. So maybe, Louise, over to you to introduce thanks. yourself. Uh, thanks, Mark. So we are Louise and Fran, and we jointly head, as job sharers, as Mark said, the enforcement investigation division of the central bank. Uh, I suppose you've seen our bios, but what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is we manage and oversee investigations under a number of different regimes. As Sean a reference today, and this is why we're here today to talk about the ASP, but we also have investigations under the market assessor regimes, of which there are too many to mention, and also we manage investigations under the fitness and probity regimes. We work really closely with our supervisory colleagues um, in terms of referrals of cases to ensure that the right cases come into enforcement. Just hand over to Fran. Thanks, and I'll just add to that by saying um, we lead a number of multidisciplinary teams, and that's relevant in the context of the sort of range of investigations that we do. And so if I can bucket them primarily into sort of three primary groups, I'd say our investigations relate to matters coming out of the sort of consumer protection centric sort of area. We also look to prudential matters, so the sort of risk that we tend to see in certain sectors, banking, insurance, credit unions, for example, and then our market conduct cases, which uh, arise under the market assessor regimes that you've mentioned. Mm. But that's not all, and uh, as, as Peter will attest uh, to, we also take on cases that uh, are in relation to unauthorized activities, so some unauthorized providers and some people who operate in the market sector as well. And in that respect, we have a great relationship with some of our external authorities like the GNECB, for, for instance. Um, but uh, Louise will also agree that we absolutely couldn't do what we do without the support we get from Peter's team yeah. on the advisory side in terms of sort of the legal advice, the policy support, uh, and that sort of stuff. So that's us in a nutshell. Great. Well, look, that's very useful insight into the, the different uh, areas of responsibility. And maybe just drawing again on some of the themes that both Sean has mentioned and Peter has as well, is that you've uh, maybe asked Peter the first question, which occurs to me certainly, in regard to, you mentioned the ind individual accountability framework, and we had, you've had a consultation around that, which is just closed recently in terms of first submissions. We also had an event here a couple of months ago uh, t teasing that out. And now we have this consultation as well. Could you just draw the distinction between uh, those two consultation processes, but also, I presume, the overlap between them as well? Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, I can take that. So, so you're right in saying we've had two consultations quite recently um, back to back. And I suppose just to, to set the context uh, for those two consultations, um, the first one, as you've alluded to, um, which we had an event here related to the individual accountability framework, which was relates to the introduction of a new regulatory framework and that consultation, which closed a few weeks ago, um, related to uh, both the policy proposals within, within that uh, individual accountability framework, but also in relation to our detailed guidance uh, uh, in respect of same. 
And I think, uh, as, as many will know, what that framework is really about is about improved governance. It's about supporting well-run firms. It's about introducing positive and consistent standards of behavior within regulated firms. And it's about introducing a level of clarity, a greater level of clarity around who's responsible for what within firms. And uh, uh, so that's very much a consultation or has been a consultation, which is still ongoing in the sense that, that we've yet to review all the input and, and provide our feedback, but in relation to a new framework. The ASP consultation, which is what we're here to talk about today, is a consultation in relation to an existing framework, and a framework that many of you will be familiar with, and it's been around for, for, for quite a while now. Um, so really what we're, act what we're doing in the ASP consultation is consulting on a number of procedural amendments to our existing administrative sanctions procedure, including certain safeguards that Sean has alluded to. And really, those changes are, uh, are based largely on our own experience in operating um, the framework for quite a number of years, and also on, obviously, the changes that have been brought about in the context of the IAF Act. Um, uh, so, so I hope that sort of explains the, the, the primary difference between the two consultations, how they fit. Our current consultation on the ASP process um, has recently launched and will be open until the 14th of September. Um, and really, I suppose, in keeping with the central bank's strategic theme of, of being open and engaged, we really do encourage you to provide your feedback, um, both at events like this, but also in the formal consultation process itself. We really look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll turn to Louise next. I mean, again, Sean mentioned uh, settlements, and your procedures in that area are well established at this stage. Um, could you just explain maybe what's going to change um, through these proposals? Sure. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I, I suppose uh, for many people in this room, they'll be familiar with the ASP process. Um, it is very well established. We've concluded, well, not approximately, actually, figure-wise, 154 settlements uh, to, um, to date. Um, the early resolution of ASP, I suppose, has served uh, the public interest really well, and we continue to see this as an area of focus uh, for the bank. Um, Sean, I mentioned, look, there's plenty of benefits um, for firms and individuals and for the central bank in concluding ASP matters through settlement, and we will continue to incentivize settlements through the settlement discount scheme called the um, settlement scheme under the guidelines. Just, um, you asked me what will change. I think it's important to emphasize that although we have under law now three distinct processes, very much what we do and what we have done will remain familiar and the same. Uh, I suppose, save for um, the High Court confirmation in admission-based settlements. Mm -hmm. And I suppose while I have the audience here today, I know the central bank investigation teams have already reached out to the people who are currently under investigation to you know, highlight the changes, but also engagement by the central bank investigation team will continue as we navigate through all of these legal and policy issues. I suppose what I would say is that you know, this is challenging and it will be challenging and you know, it's new for you, but it's also a lot of it is new for us too. So we're not sitting up here saying we have all of the answers. Um, and just turning to the settlement processes briefly, um, Sean has sort of, um, I suppose, discussed them in her speech, but just to say in relation to the undisputed facts um, procedure, look, we envisage settlement under this procedure at an earlier stage in the process. That's why it's being incentivized with a maximum um, monetary discount, or sorry, a maximum potential discount of 30%. The investigation won't have concluded at that stage, but firms and individuals should have a very clear idea about what the breaches are and what the underlying evidence is that supports those breaches. And what I would say for those who have been um, or have been involved in, in, in ASP, um, it will kind of look and feel like the current model does. Um, and like the current model, uh, settlement under this won't be open-ended, so it'll be, there'll be a finite period for settlement under undisputed facts. For investigation report settlements, um, as Shona also said, this will obviously be a more involved settlement process. There'll be investigation report, disclosure of documents, and the um, percentage discount available for that is a maximum of 10%. And the reason for that is because of the additional time uh, resources um, and cost to get to that point in the settlement. And I suppose, like what I would say is that, look, um, 
which settlement, whether a case is suitable for settlement, what kind of settlement process is applicable will really be a matter for the central bank. Um, uh, so, you know, and not all cases will reach a settlement point. For those cases, uh, the bank will have to make a decision about whether to refer uh, a case to inquiry. And as Shauna has said, look, both from legislative changes and from our lived experience, there's a lot of detail in the guidance, which we hope will be helpful in relation to the running of inquiries going forward. Um, just um, on publication, um, we will remain publishing a public statement after we, uh, after we conclude settlements. These are really important tools for us, you know, from an accountability, deterrence and education perspective. Um, but obviously, um, admission-based settlements will be subject to High Court confirmation, which will follow the publication of a public statement. Um, briefly, um, and while I have the floor, uh, <laughs> just to mention High Court confirmations, uh, all sanctions, not just monetary sanctions, will be subject to High Court confirmation. And the test in the High Court will be whether the sanction is manifestly disproportionate. Um, we are confident in terms of our sanctioning methodology, in terms of you know, our proportionate approach to how we sanction, um, that we will be able to put this before the High Court. But given the fact that most of these, um, sorry, given the fact that settlements uh, will be concluded voluntarily between us and either the firms or the subjects, um, we, we believe that the majority of High Court confirmations will actually be on a consent basis. So I might just um, finally say that, look, no settlement can occur without an investigation. Um, and although I'm not going to discuss investigations at this point, but obviously people will be free to ask us questions in relation to that. The quality of the engagement at the investigation stage is really important. And I'd really like to emphasize in the room today that look, you know, you know, it's not that we want firms and individuals to proactively engage with us, we expect it. And the outcome and the timeliness of the outcome is very much dependent on how people engage, compliance with uh, statutory requests, the quality of the data that's produced. Um, so, you know, I just really like people to think about that and take that away today. But as Sean and Peter both said, look, read the guidance. This is your opportunity to have your say. So please have your say. So sorry, I think that was probably a bit long. <laughs> no, no, thank you, Louise. Um, I might ask uh, Francesca one last qu uh, question before I turn to the floor, but just to say that I will, after this question, maybe turn to the floor and ask, and there'll be a couple of roving mics uh, going around the room as well, so please have your questions ready. Um, so Francesca, obviously we've had a lot of detail there in terms of settlements and so on, but obviously just turning to the sanctions in, in a little bit more detail, <clears throat> again, what's different with what's being proposed at the moment? And I suppose, you know, Again, will uh, fair procedures and, um, and proportionate outcomes was discussed as part of Sean's speech as well. And how do you ensure that those are rolled into these new procedures? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. So, you know, those are, those are really important, if I can call them sort of, you know, really, really, you know, sort of uh, compound, uh, compound issues. And they go to the heart of the engagement and what we're looking for uh, when, you know, all of you engage with this consultation and with these guidelines. The one thing that I just would say at the outset is whenever, when anybody mentions sanctioning, I think it sort of sends the heebie-jeebies <laughs> around people because people think, you know, we're going to go back to, you know, the sort of, the sort of uh, sanctions that has a real huge impact on people. So it's really, really quite important. The one thing that I would just tease out from, uh, you know, at the outset is that the sanctioning approach overall isn't changing materially to what we have set out in the 2019 guidelines. What the IAF has done is uh, provide and make provisions for certain enhancements around new provisions for tailored disqualifications and conditions. And also it sets out some additional sanctioning factors that we have to take into consideration. But if we step back and if we look at not only the 2019 guidance, but also the essence of the changes that are made, they are made for, you know, you know to, to enable us really to be more flexible in our approach and to be able to focus um, our sanctioning approach to ensure that we achieve those outcomes that are proportionate and they are fair. Um, I'm going to just go through 
and touch on a number, a number of other things, not necessarily because they're changes, but in the context of what isn't changing and what is remaining the same. So while the majority of sanctions have always been available to the central bank, the new provisions, as I said, enhance our flexibility. Um, and how we choose an appropriate sanction or combination of sanctions also is not changing and is and will always remain a matter of a case-by-case -case assessment. And that's quite important because, of course, as I've said, it's important that our outcomes are proportionate and they're dissuasive. <coughs> so there's a balance there that we have to strike. But as Sean has said earlier, and this is one of the changes uh, that uh, we are usher ushering in, and you have seen that set out in, the, in our guidelines and alluded to already, is for the first time we publish some guidance in relation to the determination of monetary penalties. And I know that I've highlighted monetary, monetary penalties. It's not the only form of penalty that we have within our suite of sanctions, but it's important to highlight that because I think, you know, setting out that detail, the aim of that is to ensure that, you know, everybody can engage with the sort of balance we have to strike and the factors we have to strike in determining mm -hmm. um, whether or not a monetary penalty is appropriate in the first place and then how we approach you know, how we get to the quantum of that penalty. So the one thing I would just want to highlight there is to say it is not a given that in every single case a monetary penalty will be the sanction that will be imposed. But as you've heard from Louise earlier and, and indeed uh, Shauna, um, the High Court confirmation process is quite pivotal and it is something that will, you know, sort of will resonate in the sort of area of, of sanction and the approach to sanctioning. The High Court will now have more oversight over mm -hmm. that process and this is something that we welcome. We don't foresee that, we, you know, we, we are quite confident in our approach and we're quite confident in the robustness of the process. But it is a change, and it is a change that I think people, um, you know, obviously the industry will, will um, engage with. And the second part of your question was, what comfort can people take that the outcomes we arrive at will remain proportionate and they will remain fair? So we've set out a lot of detail, and I think it's actually unprecedented, pre unprecedented but hugely, hugely timely. It's about mm. time, and we are confident in the detail that we have set out. And as I've said before, the aim of that detail is to ensure that all our stakeholders can be assisted in understanding the important factors that we have to balance. Mm. No two cases will be the same, um, and I think that's a given. So for all of the practitioners and all of our stakeholders in the room will understand that actually there are nuances to all of our cases. And we're also in a very dynamic environment which is continuously innovating. And that's why it's really important with the toolkit that we have and with our approach that we've set out that we retain a measure of flexibility. Now, I, I mentioned that flexibility because that is one way of ensuring that particular circumstances and facts in our individual cases are given that particular attention, and that is how we arrive at fair and proportionate um, outcomes and sanctions. So, but, you know, your question is a question that I'm sure a lot of people will be asking, Indeed. and so, yeah. you know, thank you very much for raising it. Mm -hmm. We are confident in the robustness of our process and our approach, um, but I'm sure that people will also derive some comfort from the fact that high court confirmations will take place. And as I said, we're very confident that uh, it, will, it will stand up. This process of consultation is vital. It's vital that, we, that mm. we hear from the industry, we hear from all of our stakeholders, and that is how we can, you know, sort of we can engage in this and we can ensure that we are taken into consideration, you know, as appropriate, um, not giving raising expectations here, people, but, um, you know, sort of, we, we can take into consideration all of those really important facets and perspectives on, on how we apply this approach. Very good.